This is the fourth video in a series of 18 videos on the Divided Kingdom period. We started an introduction and background information in the first video. Then in the second, we discussed the other God's problem. And in the last video, we began going through the kings of the Northern Kingdom, starting with King Jeroboam. We learn that within three years of becoming king, Jeroboam completely disregarded God's personal assurances and was actively working hard against God. He set up alternative worship sites and encouraged his people to worship Yahweh there instead of going to Jerusalem. He appointed his own religious leaders and he incorporated new religious holidays and worship elements into his ritual. He built not one, <laughs> but two golden calves, and then he lost one. He did not, and I repeat for emphasis, he did not prohibit his people from worshiping Yahweh. Instead, Jeroboam led them into a compromised form of Yahweh worship, worship in the time and place and manner of his own choosing. Do you remember that theological term describing this mingling of Yahweh worship with other worship? Syncretism. The fusion of differing systems of belief. Spiritual compromise was the sin of Jeroboam. He compromised on where and how worship would be done. He compromised on who had the authority to lead the worship and offer sacrifices. He compromised by introducing those religious holidays and rituals that were not authorized by Yahweh. And ultimately, he turned true Yahweh worship into a convenient, safe, predictable and useless act of just going through the motions. Back in the book of Genesis, Adam also chose to do things his own way. Adam's sin was imputed to the rest of humanity and consequently we all have that natural propensity to just want to do it our own way. It's exactly as if we'd been in the garden and we ate that fruit ourselves. Adam was the federal head of the human race and now all humans suffer the consequences of his actions. It's like when our president declares war. We didn't cause it. We may not like it. We may not have even voted for the guy. But we're stuck with the results, aren't we? Even after he's voted out of office, we can never go back and undo it. Well, Jeroboam was the federal head of his nation, and each subsequent ruler and the entire nation not only reaped the consequences of Jeroboam's sin, but owned it, compounded it, and perpetuated it. As we study the rest of these kings, one charge against them keeps appearing committing the sins of Jeroboam. Now, this isn't Baal worship. <laughs> they did that too. <laughs> but this isn't chasing off after other gods. It's diluting true Yahweh worship to mere formality without substance. That phrase, the sin of Jeroboam or sins of Jeroboam, is recorded 17 times in the NIV and 19 times in the King James. And there's other similar phrases that mean essentially the same thing. It's an accusation against these subsequent rulers whose worship consisted of nothing more than going through the motions. Even the few rulers who tried to rid their country of Baal worship never eradicated this compromised form of Yahweh worship. The immediate result of Jeroboam's bad decision was that the same prophet who delivered the good news of Yahweh's support delivered the bad news only a few years later. 
One of Jeroboam's sons was sick. Jeroboam sent his wife to ask the prophet Ahijah if the boy was going to live or die. She wore a disguise, but <laughs> who does she think she's fooling? And the Lord said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall you say to her. When she came, she pretended to be another woman. But when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another? For I am charged with unbearable news for you. Go tell Jeroboam, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people, and made you leader over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments, and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. But you have done evil above all who were before you, and have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger, and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. For the Lord has spoken it. Arise, therefore, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam today, and henceforth the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger and he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned and made Israel to sin. The irony here is that just as in the case with Solomon, Jeroboam really doesn't reap any of the direct consequences. This is another theme we'll see throughout our study. His family, who didn't build those golden calves, is going to face the brunt of God's judgment. The nation that followed him will also suffer terribly, and you can see right here that Yahweh is already committed only a few years into the new nation to destroying the northern kingdom and removing the people from the land. Now that really bothers me, but thank God he usually doesn't execute judgment on sinners immediately, or I guess we'd all be in trouble. I've worshipped idols. I've deliberately and knowingly disobeyed God. I've compromised for convenience sake, and I've broken most of the Ten Commandments. So I'm really glad God didn't strike me down, but <laughs> maybe I'm not nearly so appreciative when God delays judgment on somebody else. Deep down, I'd really like to see Jeroboam get what's coming to him. I really want him to suffer. <laughs> I'm like that prophet Jonah, you know, he was sent to Nineveh to preach repentance and he didn't want to go because he wanted mercy for himself but he wanted judgment on everybody else. Oh, Jeroboam does eventually die, yeah, but we all eventually die, right? It just doesn't seem fair to punish him by killing his children and his grandchildren after he's gone and can't realize what happened. Of course, I also thought it was unfair to punish Solomon 
by splitting his son's kingdom apart after Solomon was dead and gone also. But that's exactly what happened. In both cases, God's judgment was postponed, or apparently postponed, not because either of these guys deserved a break, but because doing so best suited God's ultimate plan. The Bible clearly teaches that although God doesn't usually judge sin right away, God always judges sin. Somebody always has to pay. Somebody eventually bears the consequences. And in the meantime, Jeroboam finished out his 22 years, and then he handed off the kingdom to his other son, Nadab. Nadab's one of those kings there's really not too much to say about. He reigned in Shechem. He lasted two years. Like his father before him, his entire reign was characterized by continual warfare with Judah. And also, like Jeroboam, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> That's a phrase we'll hear repeated over and over again as we go through the northern kingdom and even in the southern kingdom. He was the second and last king in Jeroboam's dynasty because he was a recipient of God's judgment on Jeroboam. But since he was evil in his own right, I guess he deserved what he got. And what he got <laughs> was assassinated along with his entire family. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin which he made Israel to sin. Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha struck him down at Gibbethon which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. So Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And as soon as he was king, he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left to the house of Jeroboam not one that breathed, until he had destroyed it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. It was for the sins of Jeroboam that he sinned, and that he made Israel to sin, and because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. But Nadab's short reign and violent end illustrates one big difference between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Stability. The southern kingdom, Judah, lasted almost twice as long as the northern kingdom did. David's dynasty reigned continuously in Judah for 350 years, but during the much shorter 200-year existence of the northern kingdom, Israel, there were 20 different kings from nine different dynasties. Now let me put this in perspective, okay? The United States of America has existed only slightly longer than the northern kingdom, about 240 years or so. We have the option to change presidents every four years if we really want to, but some presidents serve more than one term and other presidents die in office. The average presidential time in office is about five years. But the kings of Israel were absolute monarchs. They couldn't be voted out of office. Once they had clawed their way to the top and they were in office for life, and they honestly expected their kids would be in office for life after they were gone. But they only fared slightly better than the U.S. presidents. Israel's kings averaged only about 10 years in office. One didn't even last a week. Others lasted only a few months. And all of the kings of the northern kingdom did evil in the sight of the Lord, and almost half the kings were either murdered or committed suicide. Let's just say that the position of king in the northern kingdom had an extremely high turnover rate. It wasn't nearly so absolute after all. In 
Anyway, Baasha became the third king of the northern kingdom. This new ruling family was from the tribe of Issachar, which is in the northern region around Jezreel. Rather than live in the house of the guy he had just murdered in Shechem, Baasha moved his capital city ten miles further north to a town called Terza. After assassinating Nadab, Baasha strengthened his grip on the throne by killing off all the rest of Jeroboam's family, thus fulfilling God's pronouncement against Jeroboam in 1 Kings 14. He reigned 24 years in Terza. That's about as long as Jeroboam and Nadab combined. And he worshipped idols and did evil in the sight of the Lord, just like the family he killed. So another prophet predicted doom for another ruling family. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, Since I exalted you out of the dust, and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city the dogs shall eat, and any one of his who dies in the field the birds of the heavens shall eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Baasha slept with his fathers, and was buried at Tirzah, and Elah his son reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house, both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, in being like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. Okay. Now here's the difficulty I have with Baasha. Baasha achieved his success by murdering his way to the top. Once he got there, he was just as evil as the king he replaced. So it's difficult for me to reconcile Yahweh actually picking this guy, installing him on the throne, and giving him authority over God's people. But according to 1 Kings 16, that's exactly what happened. God specifically selected a murderer to be king of Israel for the express purpose of murdering Jeroboam's family. 1 Kings 14 says, The Lord will raise up for himself a king who will cut off the family of Jeroboam. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. 1 Kings 16 says, I lifted you up from the dust and made you leader well, if words and context mean anything at all, this passage clearly tells us that God purposely selected Baasha to kill Jeroboam's family, knowing ahead of time that Baasha would continue down the same murderous path and continue causing Israel to sin. God used this evil king to achieve his righteous purpose, and afterwards, we'll soon see, he disposes of him just like he disposed of Jeroboam and Nadab. So, question, how does this apply to world leaders like Nero or Hitler? Was Hitler lifted up from the dust and made the leader of Germany for God's express purpose? Did God promote them to positions of power, knowing the atrocities that they would commit? And if so, does God still lift up from the dust and make world leaders and then dispose of them when he's done with them? 
Does God control all world leaders or just some world leaders? What about, uh, for example, President Obama? Was Obama elected and then re-elected because the Republicans just didn't spend enough money campaigning? Or because they didn't have a good enough candidate? <laughs> Twice? Was it because Christians didn't get out and vote or just didn't pray hard enough? Or was it because President Obama was God's choice for that particular time to further his plan. <laughs> That's a hard pill to swallow, unless you're a Democrat. So what about President Trump? Was he elected because the nation suddenly swung conservative? Were people just fed up with Hillary and all the professional status quo politicians? Or was it because President Trump was God's choice this time around to further his plan for our lives. Now, Baasha was doing exactly what the Lord hired him to do, cut off the family of Jeroboam. But then what does God charge against Baasha? He's not only charged with evil for following the sin of Jeroboam, <laughs> that's a given, but he's also charged with the actual murders of Jeroboam's family. So how can a just God use Baasha's murdering, conniving, scheming, conspiring to kill off Jeroboam's family and then punish him for doing that very thing? To paraphrase Lorreen Boatner, God's motive for allowing sin to continue and man's motive for committing sin are two entirely different things. Sometimes God uses the wicked wills and passions of men rather than the good wills of his own servants to accomplish his purposes. This is so evident in the crucifixion. Evil men plotted to murder Jesus. Others simply looked the other way. Satan deceived, incited, and encouraged them all, but God used all of these evil choices to accomplish the purpose he foreordained before the creation of the world. God's not engaged in a cosmic struggle with Satan contending for the hearts and souls of mankind. Satan is simply another hammer in God's toolbox to finish God's building project. St. Augustine tells us, God wills with a good will that which Satan wills with an evil will. Put more bluntly, Satan's evil motive for tempting us is entirely different than God's righteous motive for allowing Satan to tempt us. <laughs> Think about it. When Satan tempted Eve, where was the omnipresent God? Where was he when Eve gave the fruit to her husband? when Adam deliberately disobeyed. Right there, of course, he's omnipresent. He's always present everywhere. <laughs> Didn't God know what was going to happen? He's omniscient. He knows everything ahead of time. He's all-powerful. He had the power and the authority to prevent it. He could have stopped Adam. He could have dispatched Satan the instant that he first rebelled, but he didn't. He chose instead to let Satan roam free and allow him to lead people astray. Why? The answer is in these verses. God had a plan before Adam and Eve, before the world was created, before even Satan was created. God the Son would become human and atone for the sins of his chosen people. This foreordained redemption necessitated a foreordained fall, and it presupposed a fallen Satan. Before the creation of the universe, God's plan incorporated Satan's deceit, Eve's gullibility, Adam's deliberate disobedience. 
the fact that he did not immediately punish Satan and he elected not to prevent Adam's sin in no way means he participated in Adam's sin or Satan's treason. God is not obliged to immediately constrain every sin, every time. Or, as we said earlier, we would all be in trouble. Likewise, God could use Baasha's sin without participating in it. Here's one more example to think about before we move on. In 2 Samuel 24, on the, right, on the left side of the screen, God incited David to number Israel in order to punish that rebellious nation. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. But 1 Chronicles 21, on the right side, clearly speaking of the same event, says that it was actually Satan who instigated David to number the people. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Well, since the Bible doesn't contradict itself, the only obvious conclusion is that Yahweh used Satan to accomplish his purpose. Satan is just the tool. Like King Nebuchadnezzar and various other kings, God instigated against the divided kingdom. Okay, now back to our story. Like Nadab before him and Jeroboam before him, Baasha's entire reign was plagued by continual fighting between his country and Judah. Let's see. Jeroboam reigned 22 years. Nadab was 2 years. Makes 24. Baasha reigned 21 years. So that's, what, 43 it's almost 45 years, a long, long, long civil war, and the end is not in sight. <laughs> Imagine the Confederates shelling Fort Sumter in 1861 and then holding out until the boys marched off to war in World War I. That's, that's a long time. And the Bible only tells us one incident that happened during Bish's 21 years of uh, reigning in Israel, and that was his fortification of the town of Ramah. Now, Ramah means elevated spot, so you can tell right away why it was an important place. Ramah was only five miles away from Jerusalem, and it was well within Judah's territory. Um, on the map, the entire darkened area was in flux over those years, where they would gain ground, lose ground, gain ground. I'd hate to have lived in the darkened area, that's for sure. And you'll also remember that during Jeroboam's unsuccessful campaign, uh, recorded in Second Chronicles 13, Israel lost Bethel. Well, Baasha recaptured Bethel, and then he went on and he captured Ramah. Well, when Judah's King Asa learned of the fortifications in Ramah, he was rightly concerned. It was so close to Jerusalem, the people in Ramah probably could look down the hill and see Jerusalem off in the distance. So they'd easily be able to control access in and out of his city on the north side. Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might permit no one to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and gave them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending to you a present of silver and gold. Go, break your covenant with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. And Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa, and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel, and conquered Ijon, Dan, abel beth and all Kinneroth, with all the land of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah, and he lived in Tirzah. Judah and Syria had been allies in the past, 
but all that was over uh, with the death of King Reason. His son formed a new treaty with King Baasha of Israel. So King Asa stripped the gold and silver out of Yahweh's temple, chipped in some more of his personal stash, I suppose, then bribed Syria into breaking their treaty with Israel and forming a new treaty with Judah. Now, this must have been a real sweet deal for Syria. This is the country that King David had completely subjugated and had built fortifications through all of their territory. So King Ben-Hadad gladly took Judah's money and went on to eagerly capture Dan, Naphtali, and a number of other towns along Israel's northern frontier. The icing on the cake for this enemy of Israel and Judah was in the capturing of the golden calf that was at Dan. Jeroboam had lost the first golden calf at Bethel when he lost to Abijah. Nadab had run his country well, it was only two years, but still he ran the whole country on only one calf. Then Baasha probably recovered the calf when he retook Bethel. We don't know that for sure. But then he lost the other calf to Syria when they captured Dan. So almost 50 years and three rulers into a brand new kingdom. And they've got to operate on only one golden calf most of the time. If Judah had moved the calf when they captured Bethel, Baasha might not have any calves. <laughs> you would think that someone would start to wonder just how effective these golden calves were anyway. Well, King Asa's plan worked. Syria's attack successfully drew Baasha's forces away from Asa's northern border, and it allowed him the opportunity to destroy the fortifications at Ramah, and then construct his own fortress sufficient to prevent Baasha ever again attacking southward. Here's another perspective on the relationship between all of these kings. The top row, right under the date, shows the Assyrian kings, and you can see that they don't even exist at the time of the division of the divide the kingdoms. The second row shows the reigns of various Syrian kings, beginning with King Reason. He had paid tribute to Solomon, then broke free in the confusion of that subsequent division of Israel. The next three bars shows Israel, um, starting with a united kingdom on the left and then splitting in two. The date they give is 931, but we're not going to quibble about dates, okay? Finally, the bottom row shows some Egyptian rulers. Beginning with Pharaoh Shishak, who was reigning when Jeroboam rebelled against Solomon, where did the soon-to-be king of the northern kingdom go for political asylum? Egypt, right? And it's interesting that only a few years after Jeroboam becomes king of Israel, Pharaoh Shishak attacks the son of the man who tried to kill Jeroboam. <laughs> there must be something going on there. Um, in self-defense, since Judah now is being squeezed on both sides with uh, Egypt on their southern border and Jeroboam and Israel on their northern border, Rehoboam makes a treaty with King Reason of Syria, boxing in Israel with enemies on both sides. But that only lasts until Reason's death. His son, uh, Tabrimon, made a treaty with Baasha instead. And after Tabrimon died, his son, Ben-Hadad I, and King Asa then form a new treaty so they can box in Israel again. See how Syria is working both sides of the street here? 
and we'll find out down the road that this last alliance with King Asa is what forces King Amri of Israel to seek an alliance with the Phoenicians to everyone's detriment. Baasha eventually died and he was succeeded by his son Elah. Elah followed in his father's footsteps, well actually in the footsteps of every king that preceded him, worshipping idols, provoking the Lord, causing Israel to sin, generally following the sins of Jeroboam. Like Nadab, he only reigned two years, and the Bible only records one incident from his entire reign. His chariot commander, Zimri, staged a military coup while uh, Elah was drunk. Elah was murdered. Zimri became king. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, since I exalted you out of the dust, and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city the dogs shall eat, and any one of his who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Zimri immediately tried to secure his position by wiping out Baasha's entire lineage. This fulfilled God's prophecy from 1 Kings 16 against Baasha. Unfortunately for him, it didn't work. His name means praiseworthy, but he turns out to be just another evil king following in the footsteps of Jeroboam. He quickly became king, but he didn't even last as long as the guy he knocked off. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Tirzah. Now the troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the troops who were encamped heard it said, Zimri has conspired, and he has killed the king. Therefore, all Israel made Amri the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. So Amri went up from Gibbethon, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire and died because of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin which he committed, making Israel to sin. Well, as soon as the army learned King Elah was dead, they proclaimed Amri king instead of Zimri. Now, I'm not sure what the difference is between uh, chariot commander and commander of the army, <clears throat> My guess is that the uh, commander of the army must outrank the uh, chariot commander. <laughs> At least the army thought so. Anyway, probably it was just rank. But uh, Amri and his army quickly besieged Terza. And when Zimri realized the city had fallen, he barricaded himself in the palace, set the place on fire, and his dynasty lasted a grand total of seven days. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni the son of Gainath to make him king, and half followed Amri. But the people who followed Amri overcame the people who followed Tibni the son of Gainath. So Tibni died, and Amri became king. After so much bloodshed and two military coups back to back, the nation was split over who'd be the next king. Now, you got to remember, they didn't have a process for selecting a new king. Kingship passed from father to son, but since the nation was founded almost 50 years ago, there'd never been a dynasty lasting more than two generations. Anyone aspiring to be king simply killed off all potential threats and held on for dear life. Now, however, much of the nation backed Amri, the army commander, but another 
apparently significant group, wanted a guy named Tibni. Nothing's actually known about him. Some people don't even include him among the lists of the kings of Israel. Others believe he was a wealthy civilian from some influential family. But that's all speculation. His reign lasted about four years, and the entire time was spent fending off Amri's unrelenting attacks. Let's see here. Uh, experienced military commander with the full backing of the army versus rich civilian guy. <laughs> uh, who's going to win? <laughs> the Bible succinctly says, Tibni died. <laughs> Amri, the former army commander, turned out to be one of the most influential kings of the northern kingdom, although the Bible doesn't tell us much about him at all. We'll start with him next time and cover Amri and the most notorious king of the northern kingdom, his son, King Ahab. I'd recommend you read 1 Kings chapter 16, starting with Amri, and 2 Chronicles 18, before you start the next video. Thank you. Have a good day.